And so tonight, I am pleased to welcome Anna LaPay with Diet for a Hot Planet, the climate crisis at the end of your fork and what you can do about it, in conversation with Francis Moore LaPay. As the many threats to our modern world increase, it is at times overwhelming to decide what and how to change. In Diet for a Hot Planet, Anna LaPay offers reasonable and informed ways to lead a more harmonious and healthy life. A review from Booklist asserts that Anna addresses the major role industrial agriculture plays in today's climate crisis. Responsibly researched and cogently articulated, LaPay's far-reaching investigation entails questioning scientists, attending UN, governmental, corporate, and grassroots agriculture conferences, plowing through daunting reports, and visiting organic farms around the world. She gathers facts proving that global industrial agriculture is impoverishing the land, destroying rainforests, polluting waterways, and emitting nearly a third of the greenhouse gases that are heating the planet. Diet for a Hot Planet is an impeccable, informative, and inspiring cont contribution to the quest for environmental reform. Anna LaPay is an active board member of the Center for Media and Democracy and a former board member of the Community F Food Security Coalition, the nation's leading network of food justice and sustainable agriculture organizations. In 2002, LaPay co-founded the Small Planet Fund to support movements focused on citizen-led solutions to hunger, poverty, and environmental devastation around the world. She's contributed to various publications, such as the Washington Post and the New York Times, and has been published in books such as Feeding the Future, From Fat to Famine, and 10 Excellent Reasons to Think Twice About Eating Meat. Previous works include Grub, Ideas for an Urban Organic Kitchen, and co-written with Francis LePay, Hope's Edge, The Next Diet for a Small Planet. Francis Moore LePay launched the California-based Institute for Food and Development Policy in 1975 after the, after the success of her best-selling book, Diet for a Small Planet. In 2008, she was honored by the James Beard Foundation as the Humanitarian of the Year and is on the advisory board of the Corporate Accountability International's Value the Meal campaign. Ms. LePay has contributed to publications such as the New York Times and O Magazine and is a contributing, contributing editor, Yes Magazine. Her media appearances include a PBS special, special, The Today Show, CBS Radio, and National Public Radio. We are thrilled to have them with us this evening, so will you please join me in welcoming Anna and Francis LePay. Thank you so very much. You can only imagine the pride and joy I'm feeling at this very moment. And I, of course, flash back uh, 40 years to sitting there pounding away on my Olivetti typewriter as I realized that we humans were creating scarcity out of plenty. Could never have imagined that 40 years later I would be introducing my intrepid, uh, brilliantly, um, brilliant writer, uh, intrepid researcher, Anna LaPay. But there were some hints along the way. Uh, like when she started editing me, editing me at age 16. <laughs> and then when we wrote the book together, Hope Sedge, and as we passed drafts back and forth, she had this delicate, daughterly way of offering me feedback where she would put a little modest icon in the margin. And I noticed it was the shape of a cheese slicer. And that was meant to say, Mom, you've gone over the cheesy <laughs> edge. <laughs> so she had a way with words all along. And so I should not have been very surprised that she has created this magnificent book that tackles such a complex issue as heating our planet uh, through the f way that we grow food. And she's done it in a way that has created a, a true page turner. So what I would like to do tonight is to host this by asking Anna some questions, which she will then respond to, and then very soon, in 25 minutes, you will have a chance to ask Anna questions. So, Anna. Yeah, Bob, you're not going to come join me down here? You're going to leave me? I am, but I'm going to ask you. You're going to ask a question for Seth? I should also say, I should also say, this is the first time we've sort of done this format, and it's really funny, of course, hearing my mother praise my book, because, you know, as you know, mothers have a tendency to... <laughs> exaggerate their, ch their children's uh, <laughs> gifts. Um, but it's, of course, sweet to hear her say that. But yes, she does have that tendency. I was, we, we were talking about coming here tonight, and she was mentioning that she wanted to you know, say how much she likes uh, the book. And uh, I was reminiscing about the first time, actually, we ever did a public talk together was 
what, 10 years ago, I think. It was at this uh, big conference in California called Bioneers. I don't know if any of you have ever been to this. But they're, they're now actually all across the country. Anyway, it's this huge kind of convention of environmentalists and activists. And the crowd is usually about three to 4,000 people. And they have these opening plenary sessions where you speak to three to 4,000 people. And the organizers asked my mother if she would speak. And this is right around the time that we wrote our first book together. And she said, oh, but you know, I really want to speak with my daughter. And they, you know, this is a speech in front of 4,000 people, basically. And they said, well, Frankie, you know, has, does Anna have any public speaking experience? Is she a good public speaker? Because the whole conference rests on these keynote presentations, right? And so she tells me later that she told them, oh, yeah. Yeah, she's a really good public speaker. <laughs> and I said, I said, Mom, what are you talking about? I, I, this is, I've never done any public speaking in my life. And she said, oh, no, she said, I've seen you. Said, you gave your high school graduation <laughs> speech. <laughs> and I was thinking, and then she said, as if this made further evidence that I was going to be a great public speaker in front of 4,000 people, she said, and I've seen you at parties. <laughs> Social, I was like, yeah, a little different. And she was anyway. great, and I was right. Well, she was, she was my, of course, mentor in the public speaking realm. And, and one of our colleagues, this wonderful woman, Anurata Mittal, I remember having this, distinctly having this conversation with her. I was, of course, terrified. It was the day of this speech, and we were visiting Anurata, and I was telling her that I was just terrified. And she said, well, she said, do you feel like you and your mother have something important to say? And I was like, well, of course we do. but." That, never mind that, I'm really, really terrified. I'm really, really afraid. And she said, look, I, ha I hate to tell you this, but the point is not, I'm not gonna tell you anything that's gonna get you over your fear. You know, you probably will be afraid the entire time you're speaking, but if you really feel like you have something important to say, just focus on that and remember that's what's most important and your own. And if the audience feels like you're nervous, they'll consider it a form of flattery, that you care enough to really try, want to be doing a, a good, good job for them. So anyway. I remember that that lesson, um, but yes. So, it is nice to hear my mother say she <laughs> likes the book, but it is. I love the book. Uh, my mother. <laughs> so, uh, first, Anna, I think what I want to know, what most people want to know when they meet an author, is what on earth led you to write this book? What was the genesis? Well, uh, that that question is a question that I've been getting a lot on the road. I've I've been. Um, this is about week three, I guess, of talking about the book, and it's a question that comes up a lot. And I sort of never know where to begin the story because in many ways, of course, I could begin the story by saying, well, the genesis was being raised by you. Uh, that, you know, starting from very, very early age, my mother uh, brought me into the family business, so to speak. We, we went to, I think it was when I was three, we went to Guatemala together with my older brother on a research trip that she did. Uh, I have memories of, of sitting at, in, uh, at Food First at the Institute for Food and Development Policy and, you know, stuffing envelopes for their fundraising drive probably before I, I even knew how to read. <laughs> um, so in some ways it kind of goes back to my childhood, of course. But the, speci the specific topic I got really interested in, it's now been a number of years. It really, it really started for me uh, in 2006 when I read a report from the United Nations. And I write about this in the book. I talk about this report that came out uh, by researchers at the Food and Agriculture Organization. And it was the first time researchers took a real comprehensive and holistic view to try to understand the direct and indirect emissions related to livestock production globally. And so this report came out. It's called Livestock's Long Shadow. And what it found is that the livestock sector, uh, particularly industrial livestock, the kind of factory farms, feedlot livestock that you talk about in Diet for Small Planet, that in addition to all the environmental and social impacts that you describe, that there's this other, other cost as well. And it's a huge cost to the climate. That report estimated that about 18% of global emissions come from livestock production, which at the time was more than all transportation combined. So I read this study, and I was just amazed, struck, surprised, uh, aghast at it. And uh, so then I thought, oh, well, we're going to start you know, hearing about this in, in the news. We're going to start hearing more about livestock and, and its connection to climate change. And, and so I started kind of looking for media and coverage about the issue, especially as I discovered that livestock, of course, is just one piece of, of our food system. But if you add up everything together, studies were coming out of places like the Pew Center for Climate Change saying that our food system overall was responsible for one third of global emissions. 
So then I thought, okay, now we're really going to be hearing about this in the media. I really want to learn more about it. And I wasn't really finding much coverage. And uh, so I kind of myself started trying to find the research that was out there, including studies like the ones I've just mentioned. And I came across some folks at Johns Hopkins who have since become good, good friends and colleagues of mine who also were really interested in this issue. And they were curious to look at media coverage of this food and climate connection. And they did this uh, media analysis of climate change coverage from uh, September 2005 to 2008 in all the main leading U.S. newspapers. Sadly, a few of them are no longer, no longer with us since they completed their study. But they looked at all the coverage of climate change in those newspapers. And they found 4,562 <coughs> articles. And of those 4,562 articles, do you know what percentage of articles even mentioned food, farming, agriculture, livestock, anything? Anybody want to guess what percentage? 10%. Less than 2%. Less than Less than 1% even mentioned livestock. But even more interesting than that is if you looked at what articles were talking about these issues, you found that it was letters to the editor and opinion pieces mainly. So readers of those letters to the editor and opinion pieces would think that they are opinions. You know, these aren't news articles. And so it was sort of the com that combination of factors that made me really feel like there was a, a, a big missing hole in the conversation, that a lot of us had become much more aware of the environmental and social impacts of food, but there hadn't been this connection to climate change. And then another thing happened, which um, sparked me again to, to really focus on this book, which is uh, a number of my friends are involved um, with the kind of youth activist climate change movement and with uh, uh, a program, uh, or an organization in particular called Energy Action, which puts on these, uh, has put on a number of these huge convenings of youth activists around climate change. And I don't know if anybody went to the one in Maryland, uh, the first one they did, they had I think 13,000 young people come together, climate change activists from around the country. And so I approached them, this was right when I was, was in the, the heart of doing research for this book, and I said, hey, I'd love to attend your, all, the, all the workshops that you're doing on food and agriculture, and uh, you know, I'd love to see who your presenters are, and maybe I could present on one of those panels. And uh, the organizers of the conference got back to me and they said, um, actually, Anna, we don't have any workshops on food. We don't have a single panel on food and agriculture. Uh, and so that got me realizing that there's also this hole in the conversation from the climate activist side that we need to be really um, uh, engaging in this dialogue from that side as well. So some colleagues and I organized a workshop at that conference, and we had about 200 students packed into this room, hungry to learn about these connections. And we had uh, uh, an overflow out in the, this hall of this university of, of young people who wanted to come in but couldn't literally squeeze into the room. So it was all these things that got me really passionate about trying to understand these issues for myself, and then also trying to figure out how can we, uh, my colleagues and I, communicate these issues both to those of us who deeply care about sustainable food and local food and get us to be able to speak the climate language, and then also how can we engage climate activists uh, to, to really bring food and agriculture into, into their, their work. And so I was really pleased when Bill McKibben, who's speaking I heard later this week here, uh, that Bill McKibben wrote the forward to the book because I think it really symbolizes how I want this book to be in conversation with these two movements. So and the second thought is that I know we hear a lot that when people, it dawns on people that industrial chemical agriculture is really such a contributor to climate change and think, oh, the alternative is organic. But wait, organic can't feed the world. Organic can't produce. That's the, that's the frame. And then there's a kind of panic set in. So how do you answer that question about the capacity of organic right. agriculture? Yeah, so that is definitely one of the, I think, most powerful pushbacks that we hear, um, whether we're coming at this conversation again from a climate change perspective or from a kind of social equity perspective, is we hear this argument, you know, organic agriculture can't feed the world. Or worse, uh, I remember going to this uh, biotechnology industry organization conference. I heard in the intro she mentioned that I've attended a lot of these industry conferences. So one was the, the Trade Association for Biotech Industry puts on this annual convention. And I went one year uh, and at this panel on organic agriculture and biotech, it was called Organic and Biotech, Won't You Be My Neighbor? 
And uh, <laughs> it was all about how organic farmers are really difficult because they're complaining about GMO spread and contamination on their farms and that they should just put up a big enough buffer zone of, of, of crop plantings and not complain so much and be better neighbors. But anyway, at, one, at this workshop, one of the panelists actually said that people who are opposed to uh, biotechnology and opposed to industrial agriculture should be tried for crimes against humanity. And, and the room full of about 200 people, nobody reacted like this is a completely ridiculous uh, comment to make. People just kind of, you know, kind of went along and nodded a little bit. So this is, this is such a dominant frame that I feel like, uh, and I mean I feel like this is a, <laughs> a message that you've been fighting against for a long time too, but I feel like it, it, it in many ways has become such a dominant frame that I notice how many in the media don't even question its underlying premise. And so I, I, I kept finding, as I was working on this book, articles like one, uh, uh, um, one in the Canadian newspaper, The Globe and Mail, which is one of the biggest Canadian newspapers and a paper that I, I love and turn to and trust for good reporting, saw this article in The Globe and Mail essentially repeating that statement. It was by a journalist who said, I have now decided based on my research that organic agriculture is a land gobbling luxury. Well, guess who he quotes in his article as his research to back him up? He quotes an executive from Unilever saying we can't feed the world on organic agriculture. Unilever, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the largest processed food companies in the world. Who else does he quote? The head of business development for Syngenta which is one of the largest agricultural chemical companies in the world. And the Syngenta exec saying, you know, we can't possibly, if we were to go toward organic agriculture, we'd have to plow down the forests and, you know, no one would want to do that. So, so I feel like that it's such a dominant frame. It's really out there and it's a very powerful message because who among us would want to feel like something we believe in, something we're advocating for is, is indirectly responsible for people starving half a world away, right? So it really is a way to shut us down. But what I am so excited about is that, uh, and, and I was so excited personally to discover and be able to write about in this book, is that there is an incredible amount of research, really, really good research, and really solid global consensus of exactly the opposite. That the only way we are going to continue to feed this planet and be a healthy planet that isn't undermined by diet-related illnesses is if we turn away from the chemical and fossil fuel treadmill of industrial agriculture and turn toward these agroecological approaches. And so uh, I was so excited to see that for the first time there was a, uh, a, a, a global effort uh, really initiated by a number of international uh, organizations, including the World Bank and the United Nations, to do a multidisciplinary engagement of 400 scientists and agronomists and uh, expert development experts from around the world, from 80 countries, came together to look at what is the best kind of agriculture to feed the world. You know, what is the best kind of agriculture to really get at the roots of hunger? And this report that came out has a terrible name, unfortunately. <laughs> it's very hard to remember. It's called the International Assessment for Agriculture Science and Knowledge for Development. I think, with the acronym of IAASTD. Uh, <laughs> but despite the mouthful of a name, this is a very important study. I highly recommend you all, if you're interested in how to argue this case, go to agassessment.org, check out this study. So it's 400 scientists from 80 countries. It was signed, this study was endorsed and supported by 58 different countries, notably not the United States. Uh, but essentially what it is, is um, if you're familiar with the climate science, climate change world, it's kind of the, the equivalent to our, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's kind of has that same gravitas. And their conclusion, very, very strongly is that business as usual is no longer an option. You know, industrial agriculture as we know it is simply unsustainable on this planet. And that agroecological solutions, especially in the most drought-stricken areas of the planet, especially in some of the poorest areas of the planet, is, the, is absolutely the direction that we need to go and that many places are going and are addressing hunger. So to me, I, I write about that study and then there's a number of other studies that I cite that, uh, that are 
you know, really, really good science and really, really powerful statements about the potential of organic agriculture and that this is a real false trade-off that we're being offered. You know, either we have to um, protect the forests or we have to farm. You know, either we have to um, feed the planet or address climate change. You know, that they're arguing, in fact, that they're really one and the same and that the sustainable solutions that are good for producing food that's good for our bodies, it's also the farming that's better for the environment, it's also the farming that reduces um, the emissions from the sector. So in some ways that was the most exciting, well there's a lot that was exciting about writing this book, but you know, discovering all of this underreported science was really exciting to me that I think really certainly um, bolstered my confidence to argue the case for the kind of farming I, we talk about in the book. So, you have choice here. Oh, yeah. Do we ask one more question oh. of you or let more time for the audience? One, one more question and, and I'll, I'll uh, try to be less long-winded. <laughs> so, um, briefly then, one of the things that is so strong in the book is the way that you, you know, expose the kind of greenwashing, the kind of, uh, you know, corporations putting on the cloak of, oh yes, we're concerned and we're part of the solution, but they're really not, they're part of the problem. But are there trailblazers, are there honest corporations that you can point to that uh, we should know about that are actually stepping up right now? Yeah, so as, as you know, so I went to a lot of these industry conferences and I, I went with the intention of trying to find those stories, trying to find those companies that I could hold up and I wanted to have a whole section in the book of kind of, um, case studies of, you know, here are the best companies doing the best things. And what I ended up creating in the book was a section called Spin. <laughs> because what I found at the industry conference, unfortunately at these industry conferences, was a lot more talk and a lot more kind of massaging of the message than I really found substantive change happening. So just to give you a tiny taste of it, and uh, at one of these conferences I went to, it was the green marketing uh, and green conference from Advertising Age, which is the industry advertising uh, uh, trade journal. And they, uh, uh, one of the keynote presenters was a woman named Mary Dillon, who is the chief marketing officer for McDonald's. And she was there to tell this audience at NYU uh, to, to let us all know that McDonald's was no longer and should no longer be thought of as a fast food company, but that it was a sustainability and community building company. And so her, her, her evidence of this, first of all, was the large green uh, M on, <laughs> on her PowerPoint. No more golden arches, no, it was a big green M. And her example, she was very excited to share with us. And she had some great slides about it as well. Her example was the launch that year of a uh, a, a rollout of a new Happy Meal in Europe, the new European Happy Meal. They partnered with Conservation International for this Happy Meal, and it was the European Endangered Species Happy Meal. So in this McDonald's Happy Meal, you, could, uh, you would get one of eight different little fluffy animals. Uh, <laughs> a, there is a Siberian tiger, there is a polar bear, and there were six other cute little stuffed animals. And uh, as, a, as a kid, you would, you would of course, as, I don't know if, if any of you have ever seen a Happy Meal, but the whole idea, especially with promos like this one, so there are eight different animals. In each Happy Meal, you only get one animal, right? So there's obviously a big encouragement to fill in your collection and get all eight animals. And, uh, and so they, she was really excited about this because she said, you know, this is key to helping kids understand their connection to the environment. And there was a, a, a companion website uh, that kids could go to to learn about what they could do to help the environment. Of course, plastered across this companion website are links to go to the McDonald's site and to, you know, get them hooked on that food. And of course, missing from this what you can do to help the environment was do not buy another Happy Meal, right? <laughs> right, right. And uh, so this was like her big campaign that she was so excited about. I also thought, as much as we're all kind of can laugh about this, because of course we're not dumb, we realize it's the same Happy Meal, it just instead of having some other kind of toy in it, it has an endangered species doll, right? But it's the same Happy Meal. But also what I found particularly telling about this example is that I knew from working on this book that just one and a half years before, just one and a half years before, uh, McDonald's had a slightly different theme to their Happy Meal that summer. Uh, which was that they partnered with General Motors to launch uh, and do a rollout across the United States of a Hummer-themed Happy Meal. <laughs> so you could get one of six different kinds of Hummers. They had like the Hummer with 
the winch on the back that could tra you know could could drag the other Hummers. Uh, you get a metallic silver Hummer. Of course, if you were a girl, you know, God forbid, you only had the choice of a Hummer. That summer, they also had Polly Pocket dolls because, of course, what girl would want the Hummer? So, but so they they gave out 42 million Hummers that summer. 42 million little toys. Well, I shouldn't say gave out. These aren't giveaways, right? These aren't free. You had to buy the Happy Meal. Uh, so. 42 million Happy Meals were bought that summer. That's enough for every single person in Canada plus to get a Happy Meal with a Hummer in it. So I heard about a lot of initiatives like this one that were really much more about uh, the window dressing of green versus really substantively addressing the emissions related to their supply chain. But what I, I did uncover, and this becomes the, um, the, the part in the book called Action, uh, what, I, what I discovered was that while at the same time I was going to these industry conferences and hearing a lot of what I would call greenwashing, uh, and hearing executives um, uh, really practicing their lines, like one of my favorites was the Coca-Cola executive at one of these conferences. He made his presentation and he ended it by saying, this was at this green uh, sustainability conference, he ended it by saying, you know, sustainability is where the we is where, sustainability is where the world touches us and we touch the world, <laughs> which I actually kind of thought was a little bit creepy. <laughs> that was like how he was going to frame the sustainability message. But so I was hearing a lot of that. But at the same time, what I was uncovering was some really exciting action happening on the ground here in this country and around the world, and that was action. Uh, among many other things, directed toward changing policy, directed towards changing personal practice, but also directed towards changing how corporations act. And so what I was seeing was that in response to pressure from us, from citizens and from students, I was seeing some really strong examples of companies changing their practices. So just to give you one example, um, I, I, I write about the movement now on college campuses called the Real Food Challenge. It was uh, started a little bit more than a year ago after years of organizing and conversation among college students who were active in trying to bring good food to their campuses. And they were uh, working on this in their own little pockets, you know, in different parts of the country. And about a dozen of them started having a conversation where they were saying, hey, we're getting a lot of sense that there's a lot of energy on my campus around, you know, starting a farm and start bringing in healthier food and connecting with our local farmers. And so they started having a conversation about how could they scale that up and how could they support other campuses and other students to do this. And they were particularly interested in having this conversation because they knew that campuses in this country, two and four year colleges, spend four billion dollars a year on food. And so they realized that if they could have put pressure on campuses and on those institutions and what they buy and what their values are around food, that would have a huge impact. It'd have a huge impact in, in terms of what companies do, what companies are selling and how companies are relating to their customers. So they decided to launch this organization called Real Food Challenge. The idea is to provide that kind of support to college students, to provide tips for how to speak to your food service provider, to be able to speak to um, uh, students on campuses to get them engaged, to give stories of solutions uh, on campuses. They start and ultimately the goal is that campuses that sign on to the Real Food Challenge agree to try to shift 20% of their food, 20% of campus food, to real food. So food that's good for our bodies, food that's good for the environment, food that's good for workers, shift 20% of food to real food by 2020. So they started this about a year ago with uh, a few dozen campuses as initial um, uh, uh, signatories to the challenge and initially on board. Within one month, they had 200 campuses. Within one year, they have more than 330 campuses who are actively engaged in the network and actively making change on their campuses and actively putting pressure on Aramark and Sodexo and Chartwells and all these other companies to start buying more local food, to start supporting the kind of climate friendly food I talk about in the book. So that is an example, I think, of, kind of how, how we can exert some pressure to get companies to do more than just say that they're going to change, but actually have them change their practices at the core. What's my take on Whole Foods? <laughs> I, I take it by that question, you don't mean the good, healthy diet for a small planet, whole foods and not processed foods, you mean the supermarket yes. chain. The supermarket chain. So what's my take on whole foods? Um, I, uh, let's see, you know, 
one of the things that I try to weave, one of the messages and one of the values that I try to weave throughout my work and throughout my, my um, exploration of what kind of food system we want to have is a connection between the, f the kind of environmental sustainability part of the story and the economic sustainability and the kind of worker uh, workers getting paid a fair wage kind of sustainability piece and and so I think that um, when I think about uh, a supermarket like Whole Foods uh, I certainly think there are a lot of places where Whole Foods is now that are getting you know places that are getting access to um, foods that M some of which are really healthy that w they didn't get access to before. But I think that what I would really like to see, uh, and I'd like to see it happen really soon, is I'd like to see Whole Foods be like a lot of other supermarket retailers, um, uh, a union retailer. You know, um, supermarkets used to be one of the um, places that had you know really really good jobs where you could earn a decent middle class wage and you could have a career working in supermarkets and uh, we've seen a lot of uh, pressure to to um, to take away that tradition in the in the retail supermarket retail business and Whole Foods has been really actively anti union uh, since its inception so I would really love to see uh, Whole Foods um, support. Uh, labor rights among its workers in the same way that they've given a lot of attention to fair trade products and talked about the importance of paying farmers a fair wage. I'd like to see that uh, embraced by their labor practices and labor, labor policies and do that by letting workers choose to have a union um, within Whole Foods. And I've heard from a number of people who've tried to organize unions at Whole Foods uh, about uh, actual um, uh, uh, National Labor Relations Board violations where they've been um, uh, fired or they've been there's been pressure put on them to stop organizing and I'd li really love to see that stop and I'd really love to see again Whole Foods be a place where workers themselves can decide if they want to uh, if they want to have a union there thank you yeah other questions yes please I have a question um, I, I think there's some sort of um, I, I guess what your take what what your take would be on the distinction between local agriculture versus organic because I know it's hard oftentimes to get to be organically certified mm -hmm. but I think it's better to be local than you know coming mm -hmm. from Peru or something so I'm just curious about mm -hmm. how that works mm -hmm. so the question for those who, who didn't hear was this about question about local versus organic or and especially you mentioned that for for some farmers it is very challenging to get Certif to become certified organic, and um, so how do we kind of balance uh, the those those values around local and the values around organic? And you know, I think that uh, in a perfect world, this would not have to be a choice we would have to make, right? Uh, but I, I think that we know that we are far from having. Uh, widespread organic agriculture yet in this country. There was just uh, uh, a USDA just did the first really robust census of organic farmers in this country and we saw this just came out recently and we saw that the percentage of organic farmers and organic farmland is still uh, you know below five percent and we still are a long way from having having the, the um, kind of organic farming, organic farmers and the amount of organic farming and organic farmers really reflect consumer demand. So we are often in a place where we, uh, we, ha we have to make that choice. And what I like to stress is that if, um, or I used to say that one of the reasons why I think it's so important to support our local and regional farmers is that I have yet to hear of a farmer who goes out of business, whose farmland gets, uh, gets bulldozed over and becomes a strip mall and have that strip mall re you know, revert back to a farm. And so it's up to us to continue to, to preserve and protect that farmland and, and also be helping to support those farmers moving toward organic who aren't there or support those farmers who might be organic but haven't gone through um, what can be for a small scale farmer a really cumbersome and expensive process to get USDA organic certified, right? Uh, so I used to say that. Uh, but then I got an e I, I, I said that a few times in some speeches, and a few months ago I got an email from someone saying, it was sort of like one of those emails that was like, uh, knock, 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 Anna, can I mention something? And I got this email that said, uh, 
I just want to let you know about a strip mall out here in California. <laughs> and we're a bunch of community gardeners. And we just, it was because uh, of the recession, a lot of the businesses went out of business. And this community gardening operation decided to go in and, uh, and set up a community garden in sort of this abandoned parking lot next to the strip mall that is really, uh, uh, you know, been pretty much abandoned because of the recession. And then I just got another email recently from someone else who had heard about and told me about uh, 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 a, a, a shopping mall in Cleveland, Ohio, where community activists came in. Uh, again, it was a, a shopping mall that had been really hard hit by the recession, so a lot of the stores had moved out. And community activists went in and created a uh, an indoor kind of greenhouse uh, food producing operation where they are now selling organic, local, very local food to uh, to folks that are coming to the shopping center. So I kind of have to change my tune about those farms getting reverted back to uh, you know to growing food. But I still think the message holds that it is so important that we continue to have the ability to feed ourselves regionally. And the only way we're going to do that is to support our farmers, all of them. Thank you. Another question. Yes, please. I'm just uh, thinking about the, going back to the factory farms, uh, industrialization of, of cattle production, and, and the trying to find a way to actually change that, where changing, in, encouraging people to encouraging Walmart and, and Whole Foods to sell uh, organic milk, for instance. They're, because Walmart is like the number one retailer of organic milk for soy milk, and that's been that was based on demand. And so, how do you? Nobody in this room probably eats McDonald's, or very few people. So our voice to McDonald's is essentially worthless. They're not listening to us because we're not their customers. How do you? How do you go about changing an industry or or segment of the market where where they you need to find some sort of incentivization to to get them to change their practices? But right now they don't really have any. Mm -hmm. So how do you? To, to, act, to bring about a change in industrialization of, of animals and, and, and companies like McDonald's, how do you get yeah. them to, how do you incentivize them? Yeah, really good question. And since I have my mother up here on the stage, maybe I'll have her <laughs> help <laughs> answering this question too, because I think it's a really good one and challenging one. Do you want to, I mean, I have some ideas too, but. Well, there's so many ways to come at it, yeah. but I think the Retire McDonald is one part of the educational piece. The more that we can reach out to people to understand the cost to themselves and their families from this, the, the threat, and now that one in every three of American children will be diabetic, uh, to, to really amp up the, the education of all of us about the cost of this industrial chemical system. And so that way to build demand. And then the other piece of building demand is as citizens stepping up to address the role of private interest in our political system through getting money out through voluntary public financing, which is a real option now because there is a bill in Congress that would enable this. So that then the incentives, the, excuse me, the subsidies that are now the tax subsidies going to support precisely the problem agriculture that Anna so powerfully describes is instead of that being subsidized, that what is being subsidized is is the shift to organic. And so that then more is available so that it would be m more affordable for any number of different kinds of restaurants mm -hmm. and, and supermarkets. So yeah. it's it's yeah. a both directions, yeah. I think, the building the demand and shifting the political yeah. Um, avenue. Yeah, and I think that there's also, um, you know, I think that, that there is the whole realm, and it can feel so uh, uh, so distant and so challenging to affect, and yet the more that I see that has been affected, the more I realize we have more power than we think we have, but the whole realm of policy. And uh, when you talk about, you know, what are the incentives to change, and how do we, how do we change the, some of the, the most egregious practices, especially on industrial factory farms, uh, you know, one of the things that we can demand is, uh, there, well, there's sort of the two aspects of it. One thing that we can demand is that we can demand that the laws on the books are being enforced. Uh, there's a great uh, report out of the out of the Pew, there was a, a commission called the Pew Commission on Industrial Agriculture that really came out very heavily against livestock factory farms. And one of their big recommendations is that there should just, first of all, we have we, we have some good laws on the books to enforce better um, uh, quality control and better emissions control and better labor practices and all those kinds of things. And so we can put pressure on our elected officials to make sure those laws are being enforced. And then the second thing that we can do is actually be speaking up for uh, speaking up for better policy, uh, and uh, and I think that we can also be speaking up for better corporate practice. And so you said that you know those of us in this room are probably not eating at McDonald's. 
that may or may not be true, but I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna go out here on a limb and say you're probably right about that. <laughs> uh, but I also would say that you know these companies don't necessarily know who their customers are and who they're not. If they start hearing from us from a customer, they don't know whether we are necessarily one of their customers or not. And what we certainly can see, and we can expose them on this again, whether we are eating there or not, or are they're one of their consumers or not, is that companies like McDonald's, if you look at the kinds of uh, um, changes they've made to their food in Europe compared to what they have done here, you see there was a huge double standard. So the question becomes, well, how did they achieve that in Europe and how can we expose this double standard here? So for instance, the um, uh, McDonald's shareholders just tried to pass a resolution to get McDonald's to shift to uh, just marginally, I mean really it was a marginal ask, but marginally better uh, uh, conditions for the chickens that they are buying. Uh, it was a shareholder resolution put forward by the Humane Society of the U.S. Uh, McDonald's Corporation recommended to its shareholders to vote against this resolution, even though the exact thing that the Humane Society was asking McDonald's to do in this resolution is exactly what they've been doing in most European countries for years and years and years. And wasn't there, didn't you say that there was a, yeah. some European countries where they it's serve Sweden. organic milk, yeah, they serve organic, organic milk yeah. at, at the McDonald's in Sweden and and a couple of other countries. Yeah. So I think that there's, again, even though we might not be their consumer, we can be play a role in consumer education, and we can certainly play a role in speaking up to McDonald's. Uh, I, I, again, maybe not as consumers, but maybe we're part of a pension fund in which they're shareholders of McDonald's, or maybe there's other ways to, again, engage with companies uh, that we may or may not be patronizing with our food dollar. Great. Uh, please, right here. I don't know if you know that a few weeks ago the FAO came out with another livestock-oriented study. This time it was focused on dairy, global dairy, and the and, and looking at um, greenhouse gas emissions. And they found, interestingly, that um, actually extensive systems, so the grazing systems, were more greenhouse gas intensive than intensive systems. Um, and there's a fair amount of uncertainty around it, but the, it raises this bigger issue that if that uh, if you're just looking at carbon, if you're just looking at greenhouse gas emissions, you can come up with, you know, the findings are sometimes mixed, and you can sometimes find um, systems of agriculture that are low carbon, but otherwise not sustainable. And so I wondered if in, in the research you did for the book, whether you ran across this very often where you encountered other researchers that were concerned about just fo focusing on greenhouse gases and not looking at other measures of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really good question. And this, it definitely came up a lot. It came up especially, uh, or I would say almost entirely, I saw it uh, come from the uh, uh, American Meat Institute and other meat industry uh, players who were trying to argue, for instance, that grass-fed beef is worse for the environment than um, factory and feedlot um, production. That's where I saw it coming from primarily. And I saw they uh, would quote, they would cite these studies that were showing that actually grass-fed beef emits more greenhouse gases than grain fed. But if you actually digged into, looked into what was being accounted for in those studies, you saw that the particular barriers in the life cycle assessment, the particular kind of boundaries that they created in order to then measure within that boundary what the emissions were and then compare those emissions, you realize that they weren't, first, they weren't, um, not only were they not looking at all the other environmental factors, but they weren't even really truly doing a holistic assessment of a life cycle analysis for uh, for these two different kinds of production. So for instance, in one of the studies um, that, that came out saying that grain fed or factory uh, farmed meat was better, they didn't account for the emissions from the production of the fertilizer that was used on the corn, and they didn't account for the loss of soil carbon on the corn fields that, again, the corn that was used for the meat. They didn't account for the fact, the, the shipping, uh, the fact that we are now a, a net importer in the U.S. of fertilizer that's being produced in natural gas-rich countries and then shipped here. Uh, so, so, so that's one, you know, one piece is just even within the, the within the the greenhouse gas emissions conversation, you know, is it a full story or is it an only partial story? But I think that, that you're absolutely right that, and this was something that I struggled with trying to really be clear in the book, that just because it's important to bring the climate analysis and bring the sort of emissions analysis into the story that we tell about uh, the impact of industrial 
food systems and the benefits of sustainable food systems, it doesn't mean that then we only look at that and we ignore everything else. We ignore all these other dimensions. That it, it needs to be additive as opposed to saying, I, I really try really hard in the book not to say, you know, this is the be all end all and forget the rest. I try to say this is an additional part of the conversation that w many of us have been now having for a very long time about how we have to look at, a, at, at the whole, um, at, at food as a system. <laughs> and we have to incorporate uh, all these different values, including environmental values and social values, and, and define it, the environment quite broadly, including emissions, but not only emissions. The, you know, I think your, your question about how do you talk to conventional farmers about these issues and get them to change, I mean, I think that one thing that's become really clear to me the more that I've met farmers for this book and my other two books, you know, the more that I think it's really you know, I absolutely do not put the blame on the shoulders of the farmers and, 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 and think that, oh, it's, you know, these farmers just don't get it and they just, if only they got it, they could change. That what you've really seen and you, you touched on in your question is the, the absolute um, in, in indebtedness and the way in which so many of these farmers are really trapped in a certain way of farming. And there's a, it, the entire infrastructure that's in place is an infrastructure that supports a certain way of farming and only that way of farming. Even the banking system supports only a certain way of farming. You know, I met farmers who would tell me, look, I can't get a loan if I tell my local bank that I'm trying to get a loan to go organic. They'll look at me like I'm crazy. And uh, I remember having this particularly painful conversation with a farmer in Missouri who was growing more than 10,000 acres, a huge farm, GMO uh, farmer. And I had gone to, to, to meet with him because he was the head of this kind of farmer activist organization trying to work, about, uh, work against uh, monopoly control in the food chain and was totally anti-Monsanto. And then I arrive at his farm and we start talking and I realize he's a GMO farmer growing Monsanto crops. And I, you know, I, I just really openly wanted to engage him in and sort of try and understand this what seeming, seemed to be a huge contradiction. And he said, Anna, you know, he said, a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking this way about it, but what it really comes down to is um, it's really this, this personal choice. It's about um, how, I want, how I always dreamed of how I wanted to raise my family. And he'd grown up, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get all teary talking about this, but what he meant by that is, you know, he'd grown up on a farm and he, it was, you know, his life's dream to raise his kids on a farm. And, and he was doing it. But the only way he could do it now in the region that he was farming in Missouri, and that's where he, you know, he, his, his family had been for generations, was to buy Monsanto seed. There were no other seed sellers anymore. There were no other, and he was a, a chemical farmer, conventional farmer, you know, even if he wanted to do non-GMO, there was no other, there weren't the other chemicals, you know, to, to go to be a non-GMO farmer. And as if to sort of, it was like, you know, as if on cue, we we're having this, you know, heartfelt conversation, as if on cue, his doorbell rings, and he goes to answer it, and it's the guy from the seed company wearing his seed hat selling him seed, who had just, the seed company that, by the way, had just been bought by Monsanto, right? And so we're having this conversation, and, um, and it was, you know, incredibly painful to hear him talk about how stuck he felt. And, uh, and at the same time, so we're having this conversation, and at the same time he was sort of talking about how he's starting to... Um, to change a little bit, he said, with the help of his kids. So just that year, his kids had convinced him to start growing for the first time, essentially a kitchen garden, an organic garden that was growing real food, because as you can imagine, if you're a GMO commodity farmer, you're not eating any of that, right? So his kids had, had, had encouraged him to start his a garden for the first time and helped him get it started and they had the land for it obviously they're they're they've got this huge farm so they had this this thriving garden and again it was this very kind of cinematic afternoon so because the doorbell rings it's a seed seller and then we're having this conversation he's telling about his kids and his daughter drives up right as he's telling me about his kids and she comes bounding into the house with two beautiful watermelons straight out of the garden and they were the first watermelons from this garden and he was so excited about it and you know thrilled he he um very generously gave me one of these watermelons i remember being so touched by that but i think that experience of just hearing that what he is up against on his farm uh was a powerful um story about how trapped so many american farmers are so i think the solution it's again it's not to put the blame on farmers for not being able to change it's being uh 
uh, helping describe and sort of paint the picture of the way in which we have currently a kind of infrastructure that's in place that's preventing the kind of change we need. And just in the same way we need to fight for and argue for you know, new green energy infrastructure, wind power and solar power and investment in that, we need to fight for green food infrastructure that would help farmers like that farmer transition away from GMOs and toward sustainable, more climate friendly farming. Um, so then you asked about my miles, yes, these miles I've traveled. Um, I, uh, I've, th I've thought about that so much when I was working on the book. Um, one idea yeah. I have, Anna, yeah, please. One <laughs> idea I have for an answer. Part of the time, she had her nine-month-old baby with her, so she like doubled up. <laughs> <laughs> a two for one. Does that help? Know. Does that I help her? Yeah. Uh, that's such a good argument. No, I, I mean, I like think that. It's, it's certainly, um, you know, it's certainly. Cost. I mean, it's something. I, yeah, I don't think I have a good response for it. No one's called me on it yet, but it, it's I'm sure just a matter of time. And um, and I, I mean, I guess one thing I would say is certainly as I've been talking about the book, I've been trying to think about ways to be more, um, do more kind of virtual engagements as opposed to flying myself places. And so uh, you beaming myself in on Skype for conversations with student groups, for instance, or uh, doing more of that kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I don't really have a good, good answer to that. Good question. <laughs> a lot of this conversation parallels in my mind with when we talk about healthcare, when we talk about energy or food, and essentially the consequences of industrialization of processes that give us the things that we consume every day. And the solutions um, that I agree with are often along the lines of, well, go backwards in time. Like all these things we built up over the last 50 years because we thought we were so intelligent. Well, we didn't really understand the ramifications of the things we were doing. We were looking at kind of locally maximum optimizing things. But, um, you know, and so the parallel would be in energy, we'll consume less. In, you know, healthcare, we'll Eat a, live a healthier life so you won't need to do these things. Um, in the same way with food, it seems, well, have local farms, have organic farms, don't do these things. Problem is that you've built up this gigantic economy and this gigantic power system of people who rely on these large institutional things. And um, the, the solutions would basically be to say, you shouldn't exist in the first place. And but people don't oftentimes look very kindly on the idea of let's go back in time, undo technology. Um, and in fact, the solution often is, well, the other take on it when I would say these things, um, and you know, you happen to be around MIT and, and Harvard where these sort of arguments uh, happen a lot, is the solution isn't to go back in time, it's to go forward in time. You just haven't gotten the, best, the technology advanced enough, right? If you get better genetically modified organisms, they're gonna require less water, they're gonna you know, things will, will find ways to do with better technology that are going to produce less emissions. Um, and I certainly get those, and the same thing with healthcare, we need better, you know, we need better pills, we don't need fewer of them, we need um, better uh, cars, not fewer cars. How, I'm sure you've gotten this sort of um, argument, and it's, I get it quite commonly when I have these discussions, how do you respond to those sort of things? Yeah. Fabulous, fabulous question. And I, I, I really love how you talk about kind of, um, of how to get the conversation, how to talk about kind of how we frame the debate and and the pitfalls of framing it around technology as a solution and really getting at sort of the underlying social issues. If 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 you want to, because I love what she says about this. Well, the, the I, men, I, and then I, I'll I, I'll sort of say a few words. And we'll, and uh, real brief, um, just that if we shift the frame to the human relationship frame and ask what are the that that think of food as a part of a, of a system of human relationships and the creation of power together, then we realize we take the, the site off strictly the technology or not, and by the way, of course, the agro-technology that we're talking about here, the agro-agriculture um, that we're, the eco-agriculture that we're talking about here is, is not going backward, it's going forward into knowledge-intensive approaches. But the key, I think, is to shift to understand that this is primarily not a technological question. It's a question, as I say, of human relationships, of power. And the, the beauty, the exciting thing for me about the move toward organic, toward agroecology, is that it shifts the power relationship so that farmers gain, over time, more independence, more resilience as they develop a knowledge base to work with their own soils and their microclimates. And Anna, in her, maybe this would be a good place to 
to read some section about the farmers who are developing that power then to have the knowledge to work with the soil, with the soil organisms, uh, and, and generate all sorts of new enterprises as a result. So it's not destroying jobs, but shifting to different kinds of enterprises. I know places I've read about in India where there's a shift from agrochemical approaches dependent on distant supply chains to local suppliers of of organic uh, indigenous uh, potions made from uh, everything from chilies to garlic and various things, you know, that, that are really industries that are coming up from the bottom that people are in control of themselves and not <laughs> dependent on international markets with varying prices. So I don't know if that's what you <laughs> wanted me to say, yeah. but, but it, it, it is a shift away from just the technology to the human relationship question and the empowerment question, our power over our lives. Yeah. That's what I wanted you to say. So, do you, do we have time for a very brief little reading? Just just because just one of your pieces in there about the farmers discovering the the, the Mark Shepard. Yeah. Okay. So just quickly, to give you a flavor of the narrative. It's so. Long. Uh, I'll just do a quick, 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 quick. Uh, let's see the the one that the the one about progress. That one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So so we'll be. It'll just give you a little taste. It's yeah, a little short. Okay. So this is in the chapter about what this kind of farming looks like, and again, sort of how it's not about going backward, but really innovating, but innovating in a way that's sustainable, and uh, kind of how that how this agroecology is in this way of farming is kind of how a, a different way of thinking about what progress is. And so I'm at this farm in Wisconsin. This farmer took over land that had been corn growing, just commodity corn. He took it over about 13 years before I arrived there. And it, you're standing on this farm, and you can see all around you these rows of, of you know, corn farmers. And you're on this farm, and you cannot believe that just 13 years before it was just rows of corn. He has trees and shrubs and all of hundreds of different varieties of plants. Thriving farm and gets virtually all of his fuel from his farm from solar panels and wind panels and from his pigs, and it's virtually not a single fossil fuel is involved with the production. So, and his name is Mark Shepard, and the farm is called New Forest. And we're talking, we just, this scene, we've just met, and uh, we uh, are getting, getting to know Mark. A quick glance across the road from uh, Mark's New Forest Farms, and you'll see just this kind of progress. We've been talking about what progress is. Row upon row of commodity corn, the stuff that looks edible but mainly gets turned into animal feed and high fructose corn syrup, grown with tons of synthetic fertilizer. Nationally, it's farms like this one that are part of the reason why the U.S. has lost half its topsoil since 1960 and why we continue to lose that precious topsoil 17 times faster than we replace it. Pointing across the road to those fields, Shepard asks, that's progress? He grew up learning firsthand about this so-called progress. Near his family home in Lancaster, Massachusetts, just north of Worcester, he and his childhood friends loved playing a guessing game. What color would the river be that day? I grew up in a toxic dump, living downstream from Dow Chemical, Foster Grant, and DuPont manufacturing operations, Shepard tells me. Along with pollutants from these factories were toxins from the plastics industry, birthed in the next town over. I was already convinced that the toxic mess had done its thing. Agriculture was just another part of it. Our rivers that run red progress is turning healthy soil into pale, lifeless dirt, as Shepard calls it, progress, is changing our climate through the way we grow food, progress. Shepard doesn't think so. And this farm grew out of his search for a place to bring to life a different vision, a farm that's restorative, regenerative, resilient, that approaches farming as a knowledge-intensive practice, not a chemical-intensive one. So then I describe what this farm is and show you all these cool things that Mark is doing. And I'll just end with this uh, part at the end of the chapter. At the end of my visit, Shepard shares with me a tattered National Geographic from 1993. Sun-worn and weathered, the magazine includes a feature story about his hometown, you know, the one with the multicolored river. He flips the magazine open to two full-page color photos. In one, a bright red river bubbles past an old brick factory. The other was taken at precisely the same spot many years later. There is one significant difference. The river runs clear. For Shepard, the lesson of these photos is the lesson his farm teaches him every day. 
We can turn it around, he says, and we can turn it around so fast. Just yesterday, my wife and I noticed something in the pocket ponds we'd never seen before on our farm. The ducks are back. <laughs>